Um, I, I must admit that I feel a bit intimidated by um, the, this panel, the constitution of it, um, since uh, you all present, represent rather high level, or very high level organizations, and I present a, represent a organization which is really down on the grassroots level. <laughs> um, so, um, also, um, I was thinking of a remark that Dr. Sachs just made. Um, my background is in physics, um, but definitely not in what you call directed science and technology, because it's in astrophysics. Um, and from an economical point of view, that's probably the most useless science of all. <laughs> I'm not sure. Uh, but uh, it just struck me that there may be um, some inter interesting connections here. Um, about 20 years ago, we astronomers didn't know anything about planets outside our own solar system. So we had nine, now we have eight planets in our own solar system. None of, no planets were known around other stars. But um, we suspected they were there. But observational um, astronomy through new techniques has progressed very rapidly. And now the last time I checked, there were 1,800 confirmed exoplanets, as they're called. Um, very interesting, not relevant to this discussion yet. But astronomers are now, um, or the instruments are now developing very rapidly. So we now actually in the next decade, or maybe in the next two decades, we will be in a position to study the atmospheres of these uh, exoplanets. So we can actually do a chemical analysis of the uh, atmospheres of the exoplanets. Now it would be very interesting to see if there's any sign there, out there, of the runaway greenhouse effect. <laughs> we know that may have occurred in Venus, in the atmosphere of Venus, but so maybe in the next couple of decades we will know more about how life behaved on other planets and if they did it as bad as we do here. Okay, um, next slide please. So, um, I should have mentioned this. I represent the International Science Program at Uppsala University, which is a small program that works exclusively with basic sciences, physics, mathematics, and chemistry um, in developing countries. And we do that through capacity building. So I will tell you a bit about the experiences and ex best practices that we have. Um, it's a rather old program. It was founded in 1961 by Nobel Prize laureate uh, Kai Siegbahn. Um, our mode of operation is that we give very long-term support to research, to institutes, institutes and research groups in developing countries um, in the three areas that we cover. Um, and this is a very important feature of a program because we realize that it takes a very long time to build up a, a good research group in, in the developed world. In, a, um, in poor countries, it's, it takes even much longer. Um, we have an emphasis on very strong ownership. So the funding that our um, groups, research groups get, they are allowed to use it in the way that any researcher in the US or Europe would use his research grant. We don't tell them what to do. We try to respond to local uh, needs and local policies from local universities. Um, and that had resulted in a, in a rather low brain drain for the programs that we are running. Uh, it's less than 4%. And we are funded by the uh, Swedish International Development Agency, SIDA. And at the moment, we have support to about 50 or 60 groups in um, Africa, Asia, and uh, Latin America. So, I'm just going to show you a, a table here <coughs> showing how much, what, what the contribution was of ISP-supported groups to publications in physics, chemistry, and mathematics in developing countries. And the, the number that stands out here is if we look at African countries, and we only looked at the countries where we actually have support. In 2002, the number of publications by ISP-supported groups was 0%. In 2000, 
In 2008, it was 65%. Now, the interesting thing here is that this, the, pro, the program in mathematics, it's the youngest program, it started in 2001. So this zero is not surprising. This 65% uh, may come as a much higher surprise. So what does this show? Um, it shows the need for support in mathematics. That's, what, that's all it does. Uh, we, we act on a rather small budget, um, and this shows what a rather small budget actually can produce in terms of output, scientific output in uh, low-income countries. So these statistics show that basic science are extremely poorly funded in low-income countries and that a minor support like that of ISP can uh, have a, really a major impact. Um, of course, in general, um, even in developed countries, the expenditure on basic science is, is rather low compared to applied sciences. But, um, so why do we want to support basic sciences? Um, well, basic science are the pillars of other sciences. I mean, many of the talks we heard and many of the people already emphasized that we would have no cell phones without modern technology, without the transistor revolution, without the understanding of quantum mechanics, and so on and so on. So I don't have to give more examples. Um, but even though this is the case in, in the developed world, this is definitely not the case in, in low-income countries. Um, and that is because the research capacity, the capacity, intellectual capacity, um, is just not there in the basic sciences. Um, so they are extremely weak in many low-income countries. Um, and um, an important issue here is that um, science, as we all know, is, is a, a global endeavor. So the Research in basic sciences is what one could call public good. Now, I think economists need, need something special when they say uh, public good. Um, it's like the air that you breathe, it's for free. Now, that has two um, important ramifications. Uh, to begin with, because it's public good and because it's so weak in um, developing countries, there, is, there are no private, um, public-private partnerships. So funding from um, industry is just not there. So that's one reason why we really need to um, support it. And the other important issue is that since science is a global good, um, the knowledge can be used um, to address local problems. Now the point is that if you don't have the scientists to address those local problems, there's no point in, in having the, the uh, public good. All right. So, I uh, just want to show a few examples of um, impact that ISP support has had um, in 2013 on the, say, political level. Uh, of course, there are many more scientific uh, impacts, right, scientific results, which I won't mention here. Um, in Kenya, for instance, in Nairobi, which is a problem, which is um, a city which has a lot of uh, environmental um, um, problems, um, our researchers um, um, have contributed to the implement implementation of uh, air quality monitoring. In um, also, Kenya, in its um, vision 2030, is thinking of uh, implementing nuclear energy. Um, which is something that you don't do without local knowledge, I promise you. Um, so the res our researchers have been member of the Kenyan Nuclear and Electricity Board, as well as we have educated specialists on nuclear safety, um, the whole governance around nuclear energy, which is an important issue. Um, our group in seismology in Ethiopia, they um, helped to um, implement the seismic assessments that are necessary because Ethiopia is in the East African Rich Valley, large um, risk for earthquakes. And one more in Zimbabwe, the effect of uh, this uh, Eva Verenz drug, which um, 
is a well, contribution to the mix of HIV drugs. Uh, they have been reanalyzed in the perspective of the human genetic variations and thereby the um, specific, uh, creating more specific guidelines for, um, um, for dosing. Um, a few more out impacts of our program is that um, the, the scientists that we have trained, they are very strongly involved in, say, uh, the tra vocation, vocational training of PV technicians. Um, so, um, solar energy can be installed, which is quite easy, but it can also be maintained, which is much less easy. Um, scientists have been involved in the uh, local um, Bureau of Standards, um, specifically when it comes to solar cells, because it's a big problem um, in many countries that um, countries like China and Malaysia, sorry for that, they dump cheap, low-quality um, solar cells on the African market. And they, people use them and the PV cells will stop working after six months. And thereby people are losing their trust in, um, in um, green energy and solar energy, which is a, a big problem. Um, and also, our researchers are working on, on public outreach, on climate change awareness, which is also obviously important. Um, to finish, I would like to draw your attention to um, a recent report by DFID, the um, UK Development Aid Organization, um, which came to a very interesting conclusion, or it came to very many in interesting, it came to many conclusions, not all of which were interesting and not all of which you have to agree upon. Um, but one thing was that in low income countries it's unlikely that research will um, result in products that actually are um, suitable for commercialization uh, or suitable to, to lead to a production of something useful. Um, on the other hand, the ability to make use of existing research knowledge um, is a vital driver of growth and interventions. So, <coughs> the conclusion here is the ability to take up and use knowledge and technology is, is a better predictor of growth than the ability to generate new knowledge and technologies. Um, and this is exactly what ISP is doing by supporting the researchers in the basic sciences they, in their turn, are capable of interpreting the results from the scientific world and communicate, communicate them to their uh, policy makers, um, to the public, and so on and so on. So, thank you. <laughs>